The Tom Woods Show, episode 1666. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, by now you've probably noticed that news about the virus is almost always fact-free hysteria these days. So you need my brand new free ebook, Your Facebook Friends Are Wrong About the Lockdown. Go pick it up at wrongaboutlockdown.com. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here. I am so happy to be welcoming back to the show Matt Ridley, who is the author of numerous books. We're going to be talking about his most recent one, How Innovation Works and Why It Flourishes in Freedom. Since 2013, Matt Ridley has been a conservative hereditary peer with a seat in the House of Lords. He's chaired the UK bank Northern Rock. He's got a, a resume as long as my arm, basically. And he's, he's a fascinating and brilliant guy, and I couldn't be happier to have him back on. Welcome back, Matt. Thanks for having me on the show again. Just reminded people about your book, which is now available. Last time you were here, we had to pre-order it, but now people can get immediate gratification by heading over to uh, Amazon or their favorite bookseller. I have a link to the book up at uh, tomwoods.com slash 1666. So we, I want to make it's sure selling, we... It's selling like hot cakes. Oh, that is tremendous to hear. That is tremendous. People need <laughs> to know what you're saying here. I and mean, first of all, the the stories themselves about innovation in areas from the extraordinary to the mundane are very fulfilling intellectually and otherwise. But also the some of the conclusions that you draw, well, that's really, really important. I mean, what are the what are the institutional prerequisites and other types of uh, requirements for innovation to flourish? Well, that seems to be rather an important thing to know about. So we're going to make sure we do not cover the same material from last time. And that's no problem because this book is full of material to talk about. So let's start with, again, something that is both a very, very important step forward, and yet at the same time so simple as almost to seem mundane compared with something like the uh, the World Wide Web. And that's simply the, the simple light bulb and the story of its evolution from one kind of technology to another. There's a lot here about uh, government, uh, freedom, and light. So wh- how, how does that story go? Right. Well, of course, the light bulb is the metaphor for innovation, too. So it's a nice one to talk about. Uh, And I have a a lot in the book about the invention of the original light bulb, how how extraordinarily inevitable it was, because 21 different people came up with the idea at the same time. Thomas Edison was the one who made it into an affordable, reliable and available product uh, much more effectively than his rivals. So that makes him more of an innovator than an inventor, in my view. But The incandescent light bulb then had a reign of 150 years or so, uh, during which it was um, the main way in which we all got light. And it was a fantastic technology, and it brought wonderful benefits to poor people, uh, and it increased literacy rates and all these things. And the cost of lighting came down and down and down. And then suddenly, around 10 years ago, I don't know if you recall this, But all around the world, the government started saying, uh, we want to ban incandescent light bulbs, and we want you instead to buy compact fluorescent light bulbs. Now, why were they doing this? Firstly, because they had been lobbied by Philips and other companies who were making these compact fluorescent light bulbs, who wanted a new market forced upon the consumer, effectively. But the excuse, of course, wasn't that. The excuse was that these things used less electricity, considerably less electricity. So although they were more expensive, and although they took longer to warm up so that you had to wait a second after you turned the switch, and although the light they gave had a sort of yellowish glow, we were all supposed to get to learn to love and like them. And this was really unpopular. I don't know if you remember it, but a lot of us went out you know, hoarded incandescent bulbs so that we didn't have, so we could delay the transition as long as possible. And they were also quite difficult to get rid of. They were toxic if you broke one. You had to be quite careful disposing of them. This was a transition, an innovation forced upon consumers against their interests, uh, not asked for by them. And a few years later, along came a much better technology than compact fluorescence, which was also better than incandescence, the light-emitting diode, or LED, 
which had been in development for a long time, but had finally got to the point where it was affordable and which uses far less electricity than either, can switch on instantly, can give you different colors, can it come, doesn't need to be a bulb, it can be a, um, you know, a sort of lighted wall or something like that. And this was a technology that consumers did not need to be forced to adopt. They willingly went out and, and bought it. And uh, so really a very good example of two different ways in which innovation happens. One, because it's forced on consumers and the other where consumers voted with their feet. And if we had only waited another few years, instead of panicking people into compact fluorescent bulbs, uh, we could have had LEDs sooner. I want to ask you something completely different uh, now, because you have in Chapter 6 a section called Who Invented the Computer, which brings to mind something that I think we all kind of remember from school, which is that when we were learning about, well, the history of science and invention, what we learned, by and large, was a series of names. And then people w would come along and say, well, this person didn't really invent the so-and-so. He just popularized it, whatever. But the point is where there are names associated with invention. It's Edison or Robert Fulton or Alexander Graham Bell. And yet these days we have extraordinary innovations. Uh, the, the personal computer is, is an astonishing thing. Even the fax machine, which I still prefer over the multi-step process of scanning, then getting it to my computer, and then email. I'd rather just fax it in one step, but I realize I'm a little bit different people. That's an amazing step forward. I have no idea who invented either of these things. Why not? Isn't that interesting? You'd think that with something as recent as a computer, we would have a very clear picture of who was the inventor. And if you look into the history of computers, it's a little difficult and obscure because of the involvement of wartime secrecy. But when you tease it out, it's not possible to name an individual. It's not even possible to name a computer as being the first computer. Because uh, the, the modern computer has to be uh, a digital, uh, binary, electronic device that with stored memory. Basically, that's the sort of definition of a computer. And the first computers had different aspects of this. So there was the thing called the Mark I uh, at Harvard, which um, uh, was uh, all of those things, except it wasn't um, uh, electronic. And there was the uh, ENIAC at, uh, in Philadelphia, which had all of those things, except it didn't have stored programs. So, uh, And then, of course, both of them were the descendants of theories and ideas about computers, about virtual computers, which had occurred to people like Alan Turing. So wh when you analyze who put all these bits and pieces together and who got very cross because he was uh, left out of the story, there was a guy called Vincent Atasinov in uh, Iowa who was a significant feature of this, and, and everyone kept leaving him out of the story. And he said, well, hang on, you couldn't have had a computer without my intervention, etc." It's very murky. It's very difficult. And actually, it's much more realistic. That's how innovation actually does happen, is gradually, incrementally, socially, and in a decentralized way. So the, the story of who invented the computer is, I think, quite an important lesson in the anonymity of invention and innovation. Uh, and we shouldn't get too hung up on the, the genius who deserves all the credit. When I think back to the computer I had growing up, I'm I would be embarrassed for my kids to see it. It couldn't do anything. And I would be so impressed that after the floppy drive loading for three and a half minutes, I could listen to the musical piece, The Entertainer. <laughs> I was amazed that I, I had access to that. It, it, it could do nothing. It's almost like a different machine. It was so, it, it was so limited in, in what it could do. So what about the process by which the computer has become if not almost a different product altogether, vastly more powerful than before and sleeker and smaller. I think the shrinkage of computing power or the increase in computing power for a given volume and a given price is one of the most extraordinary facts of our lifetime. We call it Moore's Law after Gordon Moore, who first spotted that computers were doubling in processing power for a given quantity of money uh, every 18 months or two years or whatever it was. Uh, and it's followed that law ever since. And there is now a law out there, I can't remember who it's attributed to, which says that every two years someone forecasts the end of Moore's law. 
uh, and yet it keeps going. And what's so beautiful about Moore's law, which which is really about the miniaturization of transistors on silicon, is that it turns out that the smaller you make a transistor, the not only does it become cheaper and faster, it also becomes more reliable. And that isn't true of most technologies. You know, if you if you miniaturize something, it probably doesn't become more reliable. But we we hit upon this really beautiful effect whereby we could make computers more and more reliable and more and more rapid and more and more cheap just by shrinking them. And then alongside that come people like Steve Jobs saying, you know what, there's no reason a computer should be ugly uh, or simply functional. It should be a consumer device. And I remember the shock when I first saw an Apple that was clearly designed to look cool rather than just be functional. And I remember thinking, how weird, they've made it colorful. What on earth is that all about? <laughs> and we were, you know, we were so unused to the idea that, 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 that it would become something that you would uh, uh, aesthetically enjoy as well as intellectually enjoy. So the evolution of the computer has been the central feature of uh, my lifetime from almost nothing to uh, quite a wholly ubiquitous thing that is in tiny devices as well as large. And in the process, uh, silicon chips are made of silicon, obviously. Uh, sand is also made of silicon, albeit oxidized silicon, silicon dioxide. I tried to do a calculation in the book, but uh, it is not yet true, but it one day will be true, not far off, when there are more transistors that is to say, digital switches made of silicon on the planet than there are grains of sand. Because they're so small that you can easily have, you know, trillions of these, whereas a grain of sand is not that small. And this would be rather an amazing thought, because a grain of sand has no order, it has no structure, it has no improbability about it, whereas a, a, a silicon transistor is a thing of very specific design and function. And so it's an example of how we we transform disordered things into ordered things in order to make our lives more usable. Well, let's move from the extraordinary back to the mundane because you have a, a chapter on prehistoric innovation, a chapter I wouldn't have expected because I suppose maybe anthropologists can try to reconstruct how these things came about. But I guess I assumed that these particular stories would be shrouded in obscurity. Yes, and you know, obviously to some extent they are, but we are learning about innovations that happened a very long time ago, and we can see similar patterns. That's the point I'm trying to make. So when you look at the origin of agriculture, for example, around 10,000 years ago, in about seven different parts of the world at the same time, human beings invented agriculture, and they did so clearly in the same sort of way they invent things today, in a sort of decentralized, gradual, incremental, trial and error way, and in certain conditions. I mean, the conditions had to be right. It turns out that the reason you get this simultaneous invention of agriculture, just as you got the simultaneous invention of the light bulb in the 1870s, is because it's sort of unavoidable, really. If, you're, if, if people are smart enough and they have enough tools, and crucially, the climate is reliable enough, which it wasn't during the Ice Age, but it suddenly became so at the end of the Ice Age in a warmer and wetter period, in those conditions, in certain places, particularly river valleys, people will gradually shift from hunter-gathering to uh, operating domesticated crops and domesticated animals. And so I think that is that is an innovation. It happened in a similar way. It's not a high-tech thing. Uh, it wasn't conscious even, probably. But then in some ways, nor were some of our modern inventions conscious. And then, of course, I go even further back to about 40,000 years ago to the invention of the dog, which we can now probably date to around that period. And again, the question is, how did that come about? Why did a wolf suddenly become a tame creature uh, which was sort of infantilized genetically so that it came to love and depend upon human beings. Um, and the answer probably is that the wolf took the initiative. 
that the wolf domesticated us just as much as we domesticated it. Wolves would hang around human settlements to scavenge on waste food, perhaps, and the bolder ones would get more food than the more timid ones, so they would tend to um, become more and more interested in tolerating human presence. Uh, We would sometimes throw spears at them, perhaps, but after a bit, we would suddenly say, you know what, having these wolves hanging around is a bit of a pain, but it actually has its advantages because they will set up a heck of a howling and a barking if if another tribe comes to try and kill us. So we'll have watchdogs to help us or something like that. Or maybe they helped track down wounded prey and we then drove them off the prey and, and at the prey ourselves. So something like this was going on, a gradual incremental sort of bottom-up phenomenon 40,000 years ago. It's an extraordinarily long period of time. I then drive even further back and try and go right back to the origin of life, where, of course, there's no conscious human beings involved at all, but it is still an innovation. All right, I have some more questions for you, of course, but we'll get to those after our quick break. Hey, everybody, my daughter Veronica is with me today. I've been telling you guys about Skillshare for a long time. One membership gets you access to thousands and thousands of classes. These are classes that can make you a more attractive employee because you have more skills. It can give you a skill that can help you start a business even, and it can also just help you cultivate a hobby more enjoyably. And I want to talk to Veronica about a few classes she's been taking. Now, Veronica, how old are you? 15. All right, obviously that was just for the sake of the folks. I do know my own daughter's age. Tell me what classes you've been taking at Skillshare. Mainly art and a bit of sewing. So like I did anatomy for the art and then the art of doodling. And then for the sewing, it was like how to sew a circle skirt. And about how long are these classes? Some are like 30 minutes, some are an hour. Some can go on for a little longer. Would you say these classes were a good use of your time, that you learned something valuable from them? Yes, because with the art of doodling, it helped me how to, you know, get creative with the things that I had or with certain themes. And then for the sewing, I can now picture in my head what I want it to look like and execute it better than what I was doing before. Thank you, Veronica. Well, folks, Skillshare is running an amazing offer for our listeners. Get two months of Skillshare for free. That's access to thousands and thousands of classes for free for two months. To cash in on that amazing offer, head over to Skillshare.com slash Woods right now. That's Skillshare.com slash Woods. I think back to when I graduated from high school back in, well, 1990, and thinking to myself, as an adult, I'm not going to be in the same awkward position that my grandparents were, where they would say, in my day, we didn't have A, B, and C, because the difference is that as of 1990, everything's been invented. So my kids won't be able to make fun of me for not having had some innovation. Okay, well, <laughs> I missed the most important one of our lifetimes, obviously, which is the, the mechanism by which you and I are talking right now. <laughs> the, the whole World Wide Web I couldn't have foreseen. So right. I guess my question is, um, I mean, to some extent you can't know, or, or you could, uh, one of my uh, old friends used to say, if you were to look at the old uh, cartoon program, The Jetsons, and look at how they envisioned the future. Well, they did imagine that it would be possible someday to speak to another person on a video screen, but the video screen would would be up against the wall, and you'd be sitting in front of it, and they didn't have the idea that you'd walk around with a mobile device with your person's, the person's face on. It's, they had trouble predicting what was going to come. You can't blame them for this. But as somebody who's focused so much on the history of innovation and who writes about science a great deal, what can you say about areas where you expect there to be innovation in the coming years and decades that will genuinely, that won't just be a slight twist on what we already have, but that will genuinely transform our quality of life? Well, the short answer is that I don't know. And anyone who says they do know is either um, talking nonsense or uh, is about to become a trillionaire uh, because they can see where to go next. It is surprising how hard it is to see the future of technology, even when it's just around the corner and in retrospect will look very obvious like the light bulb, uh, in a sense, um, we don't see it coming. Uh, and the, the, the world is full of examples of very clever people saying very stupid things uh, about the future. 
I mean, uh, Ken Olson, the head of Digital Equipment Corporation, one of the maker of mini computers in 1977, which were the smallest computers around, and they were it was a hugely successful company. Uh, he said in 1977, there's no reason anyone would want a computer in their own home. Uh, <laughs> you know, so, so, so people just don't see these things coming. And it's not because they're stupid. It's because there is something genuinely sort of unpredictable about, uh, about what's coming. Um, uh, and, and that is, of course, not true of the incremental gradual stuff. You know, the Moore's Law was very predictable. Uh, we can we can sort of tell that uh, uh, smartphones are going to get smarter um, during the last 10 years at least. We can guess some of the features they're going to have. But, you know, along comes a, a new technology and everybody thinks, here we go, this is the way to go. And it turns out not to catch on. And then another one which we don't really see coming becomes incredibly important and useful. So, you know, people didn't see social media coming. And yet it came. Google Glass is a good example of a, of a technology that looked whizzy and clever and everybody would want it. And it turned out it wasn't that popular after all. Um, so th it, you've got to second guess public opinion. You've also got to second guess what becomes possible. And you've got to make allowance for serendipity, for, for the way that different technologies come together from unexpected directions to make new technologies. All of which is a long-winded excuse for me not to tell you where technology is going next. But I will make one bold prediction, uh, and that is that our current obsession with the idea that technology is mainly about computers and communication, about the digital world, about artificial intelligence, etc., is probably wrong in the next 50 years. It might be right in the next 10 years, but I have a suspicion that after that, uh, just as you know, all the predictions of the 1950s that we would have incredible transport innovation in our in my lifetime, you know, uh, flying cars and personal jetpacks and routine space travel and all this kind of stuff um, proved to be wrong. So I think it's possible that computing will run out of steam as the source of innovation and biotech will become more important or something like that. Well, I think that's a fair enough prediction. And I think I kind of knew well, the answer we'll to my question. Ask me back in 2050. And we'll right, right. We'll get you back on and we'll, we'll review how that went. But, but I mean, I think that's not an obvious prediction. So I think that was in the spirit of my question, which was to take a, take a bold risk here by predicting something. I want to ask you about institutions because a lot of times libertarians want to explain outcomes through differing institutions. So they'll say, for example, when they try to understand why the Industrial Revolution occurred, when and where it did. This has been a real puzzle, actually, for economic historians. And maybe you know Deirdre McCloskey, but she's not convinced by the institutional explanation because her view is yes. there were a lot of countries that seemed to have the institutions, and yet it occurred in, in Britain. Now, why is that? So the question is, how much do institutions matter? By which I mean primarily the state and the rule of law and property rights and so on. How important is that? And if, if it, it, maybe it's somewhat important, maybe it's not that important at all. What's more important than that, if anything? Yeah, well, it's a really good question. And, and uh, I do think institutions are important. Uh, I think they're, be they're better at explaining where uh, innovation is happening rather than when it is happening. In other words, so, for example, the rule of law, openness to trade, the ability to invest, um, uh, you know, a good accounting bookkeeping system, etc. These are the kinds of things that sort of got the Italian city-states going as centers of innovation when they were, uh, and so on. And you can make similar stories about Victorian Britain, or indeed about California, about, you know, the the ability to invest in venture capital and share structures and things like that. And so things like that do matter. But I part from Deirdre McCloskey's uh, analysis myself in one sense. I think she's right to, to say that, that institutions over-predict industrial revolutions. You know, they're, they're, they predict more than happened, as it were. You know, rather like who was it who said that Economists have predicted uh, 14 of the last two recessions. <laughs> uh, so, 
you know, the, the, the institution's argument tends to over-predict industrial revolutions and we only, only end up with one. I personally prefer a sort of thermodynamic explanation of the Industrial Revolution. And I think this is quite an important insight into innovation today as well. And by that I mean, if human beings have to live their lives and get enough food and enough other sources of energy to um, make their lives comfortable in their life, and then got to, and hopefully get a bit left over, generate a bit of surplus uh, uh, energy, which they can then put into creating ordered structures, whether it's building a castle for their king uh, or building a, a steam engine for their investors. And that energy is a, is a sort of crucial thing, getting more energy out for the energy you invest in. You know, you plant one seed of corn and you get five out instead of four. That's extra surplus energy. Uh, you drill a hole and you get more coal out than you spend uh, the, 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 the cost of drilling the hole. Um, you chop a tree down likewise. And I think the Industrial Revolution, by giving us the heat to work transition and making coal available uh, on a massive scale, suddenly gave us an enormous amount of surplus energy. Uh, and that surplus energy was went into the building of machines, which themselves improved the surplus energy production, which then enabled you to build even more machines. And these enabled you to do new things and service the consumer in new ways. So I've had this argument with Deirdre uh, McCloskey about this, uh, and she thinks that that makes me a, um, a benighted materialist whereas she's thinking more in terms of a cultural explanation of people becoming more interested in innovation as a, a thing to be respected in society and be allowed to flourish. We're probably both right or wrong in different uh, degrees. And finally, when you set out to write this book, maybe you're the way I am, uh, which is you, you have a general topic, you have some areas you know you want to pursue, but a lot of the things you learn as you write the book, you, you come across new sources, if people uh, give you advice, whatever. Is there anything about innovation that you weren't prepared to say when you started the project? Is there any conclusion you drew in the course of doing it? Major conclusion. The answer must be yes. I, but know, it's hard to know. <laughs> Uh, I, I was hard to. I, I was changing my mind on all sorts of things as I went along. It would be no point in writing a book if you didn't. You will know the experience that you set out to write one book, and and you, the, you know, the process of writing the book is is the process by which you discover what you really think about the the, the topic in detail. But I'm now struggling to think of a, of a good example of something that was not there when I went into the writing of the book. And partly, I think the problem is that uh, I did a long lecture on innovation, which sort of led me to the book. And it had the sort of heading, headings that ended up in my sort of most summary chapter already. And therefore, uh, I think I had pretty well nailed most of my conclusions, uh, in this case, before I wrote the book rather than after it. But there must be something. I'm going to have to think hard about that and come up with with a good example. Because well, it's a, the, it's let a me ask nice you this question. then instead. Surely there have been other treatments of the history of innovation and the whens and whys and hows. And how do you feel like your analysis differs from those? I think there are two ways in which my analysis differs from other treatments of innovation. One is that I am downplaying the role of genius, of intelligence, of brain power. I think the kind of people who can do great innovations don't have to be particularly clever. Uh, I think that isn't their defining characteristic. Uh, what is their defining characteristic is hard work, stubbornness, persistence, ability to learn from mistakes, which is the opposite of stubbornness, by the way, <laughs> and so on. Um, so... Every man can be an innovator. I, I really don't like the idea of putting in innovators and in inventors on pedestals. I put them on pedestals in my book to some degree by you know, showing the ones who did it right and the ones who did it wrong and by telling their stories because their stories are very interesting. But I see them almost more as victims than as perpetrators of their inventions, which I think is a, is a way of looking at it that is, that is different. The other way in which my book is different is that I really do try and 
avoid giving government too much credit. And I don't think most people do. I think most people, many, particularly many recent treatments, try to, to, to locate the source of the internet or the mobile telephone uh, in some government grant or subsidy somewhere. And I think that misreads it, partly because it, it puts the emphasis too far upstream, um, whereas a lot of the key work is, is later on turning an invention into an innovation. And partly because it's just misreading the relationship between discovery and innovation. They feed each other. It isn't a linear relationship from discovery to innovation. Well, the book we've been talking about is How Innovation Works and Why It Flourishes in Freedom. The book we talked about twice, once before you couldn't even get it, and now that you can go and uh, have your immediate gratification. So I've got a link to it, tomwoods.com slash 1666. Matt Ridley, thanks so much. I sure wish I could be seeing you in Las Vegas next month, but doggone it, uh, who could have guessed what a disaster 2020 was going to turn out to be? It's extraordinary, isn't it? And uh, Tom, thank you so much for having me on the show and for your interesting questions. All right, folks, that is our episode for today. Dave Smith is joining me tomorrow. Always fun talking to Dave, host of Part of the Problem, one of the great libertarian podcasters and great libertarians out there. So tune in for that, and I'll see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.